In this episode, I'm excited to be talking about and explaining to you the 10 ox herding pictures of Zen, which is a metaphor or a model with 10 stages for the stages of awakening or enlightenment. These 10 ox herding pictures, which we'll be talking about in great detail, I'll be showing you the pictures and what they all mean. Um, this is a model that emerged a long time ago, almost a thousand years ago. It emerged in China before there was even Japanese Zen, when it was known as Chinese Chan, in the 12th century. So really, really ancient. And there are various versions of this model out there, as you might imagine. They've evolved and changed. Uh, but I will be heavily relying on uh, not just my own insights and ideas, but uh, a rare book called The Lectures on the Ten Ox Herding Pictures. And here is the book. And this book is actually uh, an out-of-print book. It's very rare, difficult to find. I paid around $100 for this book. And if you try to buy it now uh, on Amazon or elsewhere, you might see it for sale for several hundred dollars. And it's a very small book, as you can see here. Very thin, it's only about 110 pages long. But it's filled with timeless wisdom, especially for those of us who are interested in non-duality and pursuing awakening. So this wasn't actually written by Yamada Momon. It was a speech that he gave. This was a lecture that he gave to his Zen monk students. So this is some of the most advanced wisdom because this wasn't just taught to regular people. This was to serious monks who were in the Zen monastery with him doing these serious practices. Uh, so these are, of course, his words but also they were translated by Victor Sogan Hori. So credit goes out to him as well. Uh, Yamada Momon is no longer alive. He died in 1988. So it's uh, precisely because this book is out of print and it's rather expensive and difficult to access that I wanted to do this uh, in-depth video about the Ten Ox Herding Pictures where I will be quoting extensively some of the wisdom from this book. In fact, what I did is I just I took all the stuff that I underlined in this book as I read it, uh, and I'll be reading that to you here. Um, and this is just one of the books, one of the gems you can find on my book list of over 200 different books. So if you want more of that, go check that out. So uh, what are these uh, 10 ox herding pictures? This is a map in a certain sense, it's sort of like spiral dynamics. Like spiral dynamics is a map of different stages that you evolve through and grow through. Well, this is a map for the different spiritual stages or different stages of awakening that you go through. And Zen is not the only tradition that has this kind of map. So does Christianity. You'll find maps for awakening there. You'll find various maps in different forms of Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, and so forth. Uh, the Sufis have their own maps. Uh, the Jews have their own maps. Of course, basically every single religious tradition has their maps because uh, they all understand that you go through different stages of awakening. It's not just one and you're done. There's more to it than that. And so that's where this model can be valuable is that it, it helps you to see just how much more there is to it than you originally thought. It keeps you humble. It shows you that even after you've attained your awakening, there's still many stages beyond that that you probably weren't aware of. And it also helps to point out the various traps along the way. Now, this particular model has 10 different stages, but uh, of course, there's nothing special about this number 10. Various Christian models have five stages. Tibetan models might have six stages or three stages. Sufi models might have somewhere around there as well. So, I mean, you can slice and dice the process in different ways. You have to understand. So, there's nothing at all special about the number 10. Now, um, I want to give you a warning here before we get into it. This is a very advanced teaching. 
don't let the simplicity of it deceive you. It's a simple model, but there's so much here. And most people are not going to be ready for this wisdom because the highest wisdom requires that you be prepared and that you be at a certain ripe stage in your life where you are ready to get on the path, which most people are not, which is why with actualize.org, I have many other lesser teachings. You see, I cover a broad uh, swath of different types of teachings from very advanced ones to very simple and uh, uh, newbie ones because not everyone is ready for the most advanced teachings. So let's begin. The first picture is searching for the ox. And the verse goes like this. Beating around the endless wild grass, you seek and search. The rivers broaden, the mountains stretch on, and the trails go even deeper. Your strength exhausted and spirit wearied, no place allows you refuge. The only sound, evening cicadas shrilling in the maples. Every one of these images is going to have a verse that goes along with it. And then I will give my commentary, and then I will also quote from the Zen master himself, Yamada Mumon. So uh, this is stage number one. This is where most people are at. This is before you really understand anything about the path. This is you just stumbling around in life, trying to figure out what the hell is going on, suffering and uh, scratching your head, and maybe you accidentally stumble into actualize.org and you see some of these videos, and maybe you hear some people talking about enlightenment or awakening or non-duality, and maybe you've heard about Eckhart Tolle or you've heard about meditation. Um, maybe you've smoked some weed and you got a little hit of something, but basically you're lost and you're clueless. So what does the Zen master say about this stage? He says, quote, there are people who lack the fire to bring light into their own future. They lapse into wishful thinking, hoping someone else will provide that light for them. Have nothing to do with this kind of thinking. You must resolve to create that light yourself. You must affirm the vow never to give up until you have become a Buddha and brought peace to this world. All of your practice is in vain if you do not make the affirmation of the vow. We are not saved by our satori. We are saved by our affirmation of the vow that we must attain satori, attain enlightenment. End quote. So this is very important. A lot of newbies get it into their head that somehow the desire for awakening is wrong in and of itself. Because, of course, they hear the platitude that all, all desire is wrong, all seeking is bad, and that you must end seeking. And so, of course, in their foolishness, they say, well, uh, well, that means I shouldn't even seek enlightenment. That means I shouldn't even begin the path. And this is the classic mistake that I like to refer to as burning your ship before you've used it to cross the river or the ocean. Or it's like, destroying your car before you've reached your destination. This is a very foolish move. So you got to watch out. The path begins with a serious desire for awakening. Now later, and we'll get there in a few more pictures, uh, later you will need to let go of that desire. But right now you need that desire and you need it in spades. You need a lot of it. You're really missing it. So don't worry about seeking for enlightenment and how that's going to trap you in some sort of spiritual ego. That is the least of your problems right now because you are completely lost. You are suffering. You are clueless as to how to live life and what life is about. You are operating completely under the conditioning of your culture and your society, which has misled you and has, and has addicted you in, a, in various ways and has deluded you in various ways, and now you're going to have to fight through all of that. He goes on to say, quote, When you first affirm the vow to attain enlightenment, at that very moment, there is already a splendid enlightenment. End quote. Now, of course, that's not really true, so don't misunderstand what he's saying here. 
just by affirming that you want to become enlightened, that's a very important step. That's where the whole path begins. But of course, that in and of itself is not enlightenment. Um, enlightenment is something altogether. Enlightenment is the ox. You might wonder, what is this ox? Why this metaphor of the ox? And what does it really stand for? The ox is enlightenment. It's your true nature. It's the absolute truth. It's what you're seeking. It's the answer to everything you've ever want, wanted in life. It's the answer to all of your suffering. It's the answer to the purpose of life. It's the answer to what is death. It's the answer to what is reality. It's the answer to what is God. It is consciousness. It is your true nature. It is the awareness of God, or absolute infinity, or void, or nothingness, or emptiness, or moksha, or nirvana, or mm, the big self, or the no self. So we have all these different words from all these different traditions. Ein Sof, and that's from the uh, Jewish tradition, and then we have Allah from the from the Islamic tradition. We have Brahman from the Hindu tradition. So you have all these different words. They're all pointing to the ox. That's what you're trying to find. Now, uh, the Zen master goes on to say, quote, with discriminative thinking, you fall into the relative world. You jump into making comparisons. But discrimination only brings more discrimination, which only brings more discrimination until finally you don't know what is what. End quote. And that's where you find yourself right now, is in this discriminatory, discriminatory dualistic mode of looking at the world. And it looks something like this, quote, I'm happy or I'm sad. I win, I lose. That was good. This was bad. These are the flames of discrimination which blaze up around us like a conflagration, plunging us into an all-consuming discrimination which traps us no matter which way we turn. You think to yourself, where do I find this thing called Kensho? And by Kensho, he also means Satori. These words are synonymous, and that's synonymous with awakening, just so you understand the, the Zen vocabulary here. And so he says, in your impatience, you may even start to think, ah, who even needs this Kensho anyway? I'll take my deluded self just as it is. Everyone experiences a time when he says, I can't do it. I failed. At this time, especially, you must not think to give up and return to your lay life, to the ordinary life of delusion. So, th this notion that I sometimes hear quite often when people hear about awakening or enlightenment, it's like, ah, oh, Leo, but, but yeah, all this, all this seeking and searching, all this spiritual questing, eh, I mean, what's, what's the big deal? I don't want to get, uh, you know, all hot and bothered about that. I, my life's not that bad. What's the problem, Leo? Well, um, you haven't suffered yet. You see, you haven't suffered yet. When you really suffer, you're going to then... Uh, maybe come back and rethink that line of thought. People trick themselves out of even beginning the journey, you see? That's the greatest trick the devil plays, is to get you to believe that there's not even a reason to, to begin this journey. Because the devil will say something to you like, well, uh, emptiness, nothingness, well, who cares about this? Leo, if I attain emptiness, that sounds pretty bleak, sounds pretty nihilistic. Why would anyone want to attain emptiness? How's that going to improve my life? Why would I want to end the ego? Leo, I like being an ego. I just want to like eat good food and chase girls and, and earn money. What's wrong with that? I think that'll work just fine. That's your ignorance. See, that's the devil in you speaking. That's the ego speaking. You got to be smarter than that not to fall for those tricks. And lastly, he says, quote, remember the saying, a person of great talent is slow to mature. A person of great character is developed slowly, enduring great suffering along the way. So this here is preparing you for the long trek ahead 
to catch this ox. And sometimes people criticize me and they'd say, oh, Leo, why do you tell people that it takes thousands of hours? Why do you tell people that it's, it involves suffering and it's so difficult when, Leo, it's so easy. It's here right now. You're already enlightened. Look, it's so simple. It's so simple. There's nothing hard about this. It's to prepare you. It's to prepare you. This is a difficult journey. Now, if you get lucky and it happens to come to you easily, great. But don't go in expecting that. This is like a journey to climb, to climb Mount Everest. You have to appreciate the significance of this journey that you're undertaking. Only then will you succeed. Because otherwise, as a fool, you just sort of rush in thinking that you can just run up the mountain. And then you realize, wait a minute, I'm running out of breath and it's getting cold and I'm running out of food and I need water and I'm getting tired and my legs are hurting and there's this snowstorm coming. And then what happens? Then you, you run back and then you never try it again. That's the foolish way to go about it. The smart way to go about it is to understand that this is something serious. This is something valuable. This is something that's worth your, your careful attention and the investment of your time and your effort. And it's worth a little bit of suffering and challenge, and it's worth a couple thousand hours of work. And uh, the Zen master also says, quote, you will achieve nothing if you work on your koan only when you happen to think of it. And by koan, of course, that's one particular technique of attaining awakening. But he also here means meditation, he means yoga, he means self-inquiry or any other spiritual process that you're using to attain your awakening. So he says, your efforts will result in nothing more than froth carried away in the stream. But if you push on straight ahead, single-mindedly without break, then there will be a time when suddenly your eye opens. See, So you got to be very consistent and persistent with this work. Now, picture number two, seeing the footprints. The verse, by the water and under the trees, tracks thick and fast. In the sweet grasses, thick with growth, did you see it or did you not? But even in the depths of the deepest mountains, how could it hide from others? Its snout turned towards the sky. So this is the stage where many of you are at. This is the stage where You've heard about meditation, you've heard about awakening, you've read a few books about it, you watched some videos of Rupert Spira or Muji or Eckhart Tolle or of myself talking about this stuff, you've heard anecdotes, you're a little bit excited about it, you're interested in it, you're studying, you're reading, you're watching videos, you're even doing some practices. Maybe you've done uh, 15 minutes of self-inquiry here and there, maybe you've meditated 20 minutes here and there, maybe you've done even a little psychedelic and you've gotten a little a little glimmer of something, or maybe while you're meditating or doing your yoga, you've got a little glimmer of something and you're like, wait a minute, what was that? Or maybe you were watching one of my episodes, like the one about what is actuality or the one about what is perception. And when I'm demonstrating something to you and I'm trying to point you towards the ox, you get a little glimmer of it, but then your ego kind of cl something clicks in your ego and your ego kind of freaks out. Your heart starts to pound and then you realize something weird is going on, but then you only get a little like taste of it, like a second or five seconds of it. This is you seeing the footprints. This is you starting to smell that, wait a minute, this ox, this ox that I've heard about, it's, th there actually is such a thing as an ox. Now I haven't seen it yet. I only see the footprints. And this is a very important stage because a lot of people, again, trick themselves out of even getting to this stage because this is where the skepticism and the rationalism comes in. And these smart Alec skeptics, they start to say things to me like, oh, Leo, well, why don't you prove, prove awakening to me, prove that this ox is real. Why should I believe you? Science doesn't know anything about this ox. If it was true, then all the scientists would be talking about it. This kind of delusionary thinking. Here's what the Zen master has to say about this stage. Quote, despite the fact that there are so many traces of the ox everywhere, still you haven't seen it. This is because you are stuck in the weeds of self-delusion. 
The thickets of self-delusion are choked with overgrowth. It does not matter how much you seek, how much you search. Always you are buried under a mountain of self-delusion choked with weeds of mistaken thinking, with weeds of intellectualization. End quote. So, uh, that's another trap you're going to fall into here, is that there's going to be this tendency to hear about non-duality and awakening and enlightenment, and rather than actually doing the practices, rather than sitting down and doing self-inquiry, you're just going to read books, and you're going to watch a bunch of videos, and you're going to gather a bunch of theory, and you're going to build a philosophy of non-duality, thinking that, oh, I'm already awakened, look, I've got it, I figured it out, I understand what's being talked about here. And really what you're doing here is you're just deluding yourself. You're building an imaginary ox. You're not actually going out there to find the real wild ox. In the wilderness, you're just concocting some fantasy ox in your mind and thinking that that's what enlightenment is. And that's very dangerous. So watch out. He also goes on to say, quote, Sometimes you hear it said that Zen monks do not have to read books or to study. Where did this misleading idea start? It's ridiculous to think that this could possibly be true. We say Zen is a separate transmission outside of the scriptures, but it is only because there is a teaching that there is something transmitted separate from it. If we do not first study the sutras and ponder the records of the ancients, we will end up going off in the wrong direction altogether. The ancient teachers engaged in all branches of scholarship and studied all there was to study. End quote. That's very important. So again, some of these neo advaitin folks, they, they like to um, criticize me and say, oh, Leo, but, but what are you talking about reading books and studying non-duality? All this is nonsense. All you got to do is you just got to sit down and you just got to self-inquire. Or even worse, you're already enlightened. Well, the Zen master disagrees. And you have to understand that when I give advice, I don't just give advice from my own experiences and opinions. I ground my advice in hundreds of sources, high quality sources, not just high quality sources, but some of the most high quality sources ever, ever in human history. And one of these sources is the Zen master that I'm quoting to you right now. See, these people have decades of experience. They're not dilettantes, they're masters. And these masters understand nuances of these paths that ordinary people and even um, most regular teachers don't understand. So it's wise to listen to them. He also says, quote, In the Lotus Sutra, it is written that daily duties and attending to work is nothing other than true reality. When we do business or farm or do temple work or engage in politics and economics, all of this is Buddha Dharma. If without studying the sutras, you merely sit in Zazen and get swell-headed because you've passed some koans, or even, heaven forbid, you have had Satori and received permission to teach, you will become a Zen devil. End quote. And here I will refer you to my um, in-depth video about the topic of Zen devilry calling, uh, called Becoming a Zen Devil. Go check that out. It's a, it's a very common phenomenon. People get a little bit of a, of a taste of the ox and then they think they figured it all out and now they think they're ready to teach and they think that now they uh, are immune to delusion. And of course, that's precisely when they become the most deluded. They become a Zen devil. And this is why we read and we study and uh, we listen to masters because they have decades of experience. They understand all of the newbie traps. They understand that the path is deeper than it first seems. Just because you've had one little glimpse of something doesn't mean that you've really attained it yet. And there's still a lot of potential for abuse, delusion, creating cults of various kinds and misinterpreting whatever Satori you think you've had. All of these are possibilities. 
And I guarantee you that you will be deluded about non-duality if you do not read and do not study. Now, of course, here the Zen master was talking about reading, uh, reading the, the scriptures and the sutras. Uh, but now, in modern times, we expand that notion out. So you're not going to be re really reading that many sutras, per se, if you're following actualize.org. But like you're going to be reading lots of books on my book list, for example, about non-duality. One of which, of course, is this book. And there are many others that you will need to read besides this one in order to learn about all the pitfalls and traps of this awakening process. And lastly, he says about this picture, if you've seen the tracks, then do not throw down your staff in frustration and call it quits. Follow up the tracks until you have finally caught it. So long as you do not give up the affirmation of your vow, so long as you do not break with the, uh, do not break your staff in frustration, for certain you will be able to catch the ox. End quote. So sometimes people say, oh, Leo, but this awakening, you make it sound like it's such a rare thing, such a difficult thing. What are my odds of awakening? If I put in all these thousands of hours, how do I know uh, that I'll actually awaken? And the answer is, is that if you're serious and if you make this vow the way that he's telling you you should, then it's not going to be a matter of probability or chance. You will awaken. It's just a matter of how serious you are. And when I say that the majority of people will never awaken, 99% of people will never awaken, well, firstly, that's because most of them never even begin this path at all. They don't even know that such a thing is possible. Secondly, it's because they deny and they resist. They, they actively are skeptical about this, and so they never actually do any practices. So that already eliminates 95% of people. Uh, but then also the reason I say that is because they don't have that desire and that commitment, that thirst for truth. They don't have that. They also don't study the various traps along the way. So it's because of this that it's very easy to predict that most people will fail and that therefore the failure rate is like 99%. But that doesn't matter to you because you're going to be the serious uh, one. You're, you're going to be the one who has a laser-focused desire for the truth and you're going to read all the material you need to read and study everything to learn about all the traps and then you will have a 100% chance of awakening, as long as you're persistent and you're committed. Now, picture number three, seeing the ox. The verse, in the trees, nightingales sing and sing again. Sun warms the soft wind, green willows line the banks. Here, there's nowhere left for it to hide. Its majestic head and horns, no artist could draw. So this is a very critical stage in the awakening process because here you see the ox for the first time in the flesh. Up until this point, you've heard all sorts of stories, you've heard all sorts of metaphors and allegories, and you've seen all the pictures and, and all these people talking wonderful things about it, but here now you get a look at it. And this is what I would call your first mystical experience. It's almost like a really good comparison is that it's almost like having your first orgasm. You discover this amazing new world. The world of sexuality opens up to you for the first time. And all of a sudden you, you realize, oh, oh, so that's what all that sexual stuff was about that I didn't understand as a kid. Like, why were people interested in kissing and hugging and and why were men chasing women and why were women chasing men and all of this romance stuff that I saw. Oh, now it all makes sense. See, so, so this is what happens when you have your first mystical experience Then all of a sudden it's like, oh shit. Oh my God, this is amazing. This is like a whole new, a whole new gateway opened up, a whole new world. Now I understand all of the, all the spiritual mumbo jumbo and all the hippies and all the people talking about oneness and this and God and divinity and, and all the religions, oh, 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 it wasn't just talk. See? It's actually something. The ox is a real thing. It's not just footprints. It's not just wishful thinking. And also what happens is that when you catch a glimpse of this ox, you realize, man, uh, we're going to need a bigger boat. 
I'm going to need a bigger rope to catch this thing. This thing is way larger than I ever imagined. This thing is a fucking monster. It's a beast. This changes everything. This is nothing like what I imagined the ox was like. It's almost as though you were chasing this ox and you thought this ox was like a chihuahua sized creature. And then you discover that this ox is actually a, a fucking dragon, a Tyrannosaurus Rex, and you're going to have to catch this thing. And so that can be a little bit daunting. Usually what happens is that when you catch sight of the ox for the first time, it's so astonishing and so powerful and it just hits you so out of the blue like a lightning bolt that it catches you completely unawares and you're not able to hold on to it for more than a few seconds. It freaks you out. It scares you. It terrifies you. It's awesome. It's so awesome. It's terrifying. And then what happens is that you recoil and you quickly get back into your old ego self. And then you look around and like, where'd the ox go? Because you only caught a little glimpse of it. It's so magnificent, you can't, you can't stand to look it in the eyes. It's so magnificent and radiant. You're going to have to develop yourself just to be able to look this thing in the eyes. Let's see what the Zen master has to say about this. Quote, Still, you have not really caught the ox. You have just caught a glimpse from behind. You still have seven more stages to go. To catch the ox and train it is no easy task, but first you must, ca you must catch sight of it. End quote. So this is a very important stage because once you do catch sight of it and it awes you and also terrifies you at the same time, now you can get really serious about this work because now you know it's real and now you're clamoring to get another look at it. It's almost like seeing a rare bird lost in the rainforest. And then you, you catch sight of this bird just kind of flitting through the leaves. And it's such a beautiful, magnificent bird. It's like, I want to see it again. But it took you years just to catch a glimpse of it the first time, deep in the jungle. Well, now you got to spend a few more years to catch another glimpse. And that can be quite frustrating. He goes on to say, quote, One could not capture in a picture the beauty of its horns, their fine shape. To attempt to draw them would be uh, to make two things where there was one. End quote. And this is the whole problem of communicating the incommunicable. Communicating non-duality. How can you communicate the ox when the very communication itself is a part of the ox? All language is dualistic. All maps are never the territory. And here, we're interested in getting to the territory itself. The territory is the ox. And the map is this, this model that we're talking about, these 10 pictures, and all of the teachings, and all the scriptures, and everything I've ever said in actualize.org, that's the map. And the territory is the ox itself. He goes on to say, quote, Kensho, or awakening, Achieved sitting on a zazen cushion is weak in action. Through contact with the outside world, you must also grasp the life that throbs there. The power that you have built up through samadhi is smashed to pieces by the sounds of the outside world. It is shattered by the sights of the outside world. End quote. So you see, this whole awakening process is going to be more than you bargained for. It's going to be more challenging than you initially thought. Initially, you thought that, hey, I would just get my enlightenment. Bam, one day it would just happen, and then it would all be easy and downhill from there. I wouldn't need to do any more work. I would just be enlightened, and I'd get to walk around and tell people how enlightened I am, and I'd get to pride myself on how, how awesome I am and how spiritual I am. That's uh, our initial newbie ideas of what awakening is like. And then we discover that, no, 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 this whole thing is going to uh, turn your life upside down. And if you really want to embody the ox, that's going to require a lot more than just catching a glimpse of it here and there. He goes on to say, quote, Salt in running water is not visible to the eye. Similarly, the glue that is always mixed in the artist's paint is not visible to the eye. 
the eye sees only the colors blue or green or red. In exactly the same way, our Buddha nature has no shape or form. All is the ox. If you are looking but cannot see the ox, that just means your mind is full of unnecessary thinking, prejudice, false knowledge, and mistaken opinions. End quote. Picture number four, catching the ox. The verse, with your last ounce of strength, you take it, but stubborn and strong, it won't be broken. Now it suddenly climbs on high ground, then it descends to vanish deep into the mist. This is a stage where you're trying to catch the ox and own it for yourself. This is you going beyond the initial first glimpses and starting to really embody awakening in your everyday life and also realizing how much more difficult it is to do that than you thought. Here's what the Zen master has to say. Quote, just catching the ox is not enough. You must get a tight rope on it, tame it, and make it your own. A mind of thoughts and attachments can't possibly fathom the spirit of the ox that is called original face. With your f head full of thoughts of good and bad, pretty and ugly, even should you seek out the spirit of the ox of Buddha nature, there is no way that you would be able to recognize it if you saw it. Don't deceive yourself into thinking that you can feed it your desires and attachments, your passions and self-delusions. The ox of fundamental wholeness will run away at the mere smell of them. If there is even the slightest whiff of impurity, the ox won't touch the grass. The ox of fundamental wholeness detests even the smell of the actual. It is strictly pure. It hates the world of desires and attachments, passions and self-delusions, and it will trot right off to the mountains. End quote. So here is where you're in for the sort of rude awakening that in order to really catch this ox, you're going to have to completely surrender yourself. Turn your entire psyche inside out. Your egotism stands in the way of you catching the ox and taming the ox. And so now you have to make a choice. Your devilish ego self and your old, depraved, deluded life, full of attachments and cravings and suffering and desire and addictions and hedonism, or the ox. You can't have both. And you can't attain the ox so long as you have your fantasies about what spirituality is, what religion is, what God is, what the, what the ox is, uh, what good and evil are, what the devil is, uh, uh, your various political ideologies and your, your economic ideologies and capitalism and socialism and liberalism, conservatism, and all of this, all of this junk, all of this fantasy, all of this social programming, this you have to discard if you want the ox. You cannot have the full ox and also maintain all of that nonsense that your ego was using to maintain its grip on reality. See, a lot of egos, what they try to do with spirituality is they, they think that, oh, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna catch this ox and then I'm gonna own this ox, I'm gonna monopolize this ox for myself and then I'll sell the ox and I'll make a bunch of money off the ox and then I'll have a bunch of sex using the ox and then I'm gonna look cool using the ox, I'm gonna get a bunch of fame and status using the ox, I'm gonna build a religion in my name using the ox and I'm going to develop this cult using the ox. And that won't work. Because all of that stuff is fantasy. And the only reason you want to do any of that stuff is because you don't really have the ox. You haven't tamed the ox. You haven't fully realized what the ox is. Because if you did, the ox would irradiate and expunge, blot out all of this egotistical craving within you, all of these schemes and machinations and manipulations that you are uh, trying to attain in the name of the ox. And this is how 
all of the world's greatest evils happen. All of the evils of religion happen this way. Is that rather than actually fully pursuing and surrendering to the ox, the religious person tries to turn the ox into some kind of religious system. But the ox will not ever be turned into, into any kind of system, into any kind of picture or model or map, because the ox is the territory, not the map. And this is where people get caught in the trap of talking about the ox, theorizing about the ox, building a philosophical system about the ox. Uh, when they really are avoiding the very difficult thing, which is letting go of all of that, surrendering all of that, emptying yourself before the ox. Only then will the ox allow you to approach it closely enough so that you can tame it. The Zen master goes on to say, quote, you have caught the ox. You, you may have caught the ox, but it is no easy matter to break it and finally to make it your own. It is like killing a snake. It's still twitching. Your mouth is going moo, but your tail is still twitching. You are not completely dead yet. So long as you do not first attain the great death, the samadhi of Mu, you will never catch the ox. End quote. So Mu in Zen is just another name for the absolute, for God, for the ox, for mm, infinite consciousness, your true nature. That's Mu. The realization that all of reality is nothing. That's Mu. You see, so even though maybe you've glimpsed Mu, the question is, have you fully died to it? Or is your ego still twitching and it's going to come back to life like a zombie? And now it's going to turn into this sort of spiritualized zombie where now, you, of course, you've, you've got a little taste of awakening and you kind of know what it's like. But your ego is still alive and kicking. It's still on its last breath. And so if you're not careful, that ego will make all sorts of devilish work out of this glimpse of awakening that you've had. And that can become very dangerous. You might, for example, want to start a cult now based on your little bit of awakening. And then that cult, though, is going to be fueled by all the cravings and attachments of your ego, which you are still not willing to fully surrender in order to, to truly awaken. Because if you were truly awake, you would never start a cult. Because cults are falsehood, and awakening is truth. And there's also no need, once you're awake, to have admiration from others, or to build any kind of pyramid structure with you on top. You don't need social status, you don't need fame, you don't need money, you don't need sex. None of these things are needed anymore because the ox has satisfied everything within you. The ox has made you complete. But that's only once you fully tame the ox. At this stage, you haven't done that yet, so you still have various kinds of base needs. The bottom tier of uh, Maslow's pyramid uh, of psychological needs food, sex, shelter, survival, and um, self-esteem, and need for love, and all this, you still have these, even though you've had a little bit of Satori. Now, picture number five is taming the ox. The verse. Not for a moment put down whip or rein, lest the ox wander back to dust and desire. Pull again and again till it's tame and gentle. Of itself it will follow without bridle or chain. This is the stage where you get really serious about taming the ox, about embodying this enlightenment and letting it purify you. So this is a stage where a lot of spiritual work and inner work is done. A lot of spiritual purification happens. And this can be a stage that can be quite challenging. It can be quite grueling because you realize more and more just how much egotism and devilry there is within you that you need to surrender to fully tame this ox. And so it's just this constant struggle of, of, of 
self-reflecting and finding more and more ignorance and devilry within yourself, all of your selfishness, all of this has to go. It's sort of like opening a garage and seeing just how much mess there is in the garage when you have to have the task of cleaning up the garage. You didn't think it was that messy. And now you see the severity of the task before you. Here's what the Zen master says about this stage. Quote, Well now, you have finally caught the ox, but this ox will not do what you want it to do. That's why you have to train it and make it your own. This is what is otherwise known as post-satori practice. Kensho or awakening is our goal, but without any follow-up, Kensho amounts to nothing. You must tame that ox which you worked so hard to catch. For us, training and practice continue right up until we die. The most important chapter of the ten ox-herding pictures is this one, where you sit down and chew the cud of Satori, fully appreciating its texture. End quote. And this is another place where a lot of people get tripped up, especially if they follow some Neo-Advaitin teachings or teachers is they think that, oh, okay, now I've awoken, I've had my Satori, and now there's nothing more to do, right? This is what separates the noobs from the masters. The master is the one who has gone through this entire process of letting uh, the awakening purify him of all of his selfishness. And that's usually a process that takes years and decades. And of course, that's why nobody wants to do it. And that's why it's so rare. And that's why masters are so valuable. It's very easy to trick yourself into thinking that once you've had your Satori, well, that's it. There's no more work to do. Leo, what's the point of any other kind of work? Well, then why do these Zen masters spend decades perfecting their Satoris? Because in practice, they have to. Otherwise, they're still going to have cravings and desires and all sorts of low consciousness needs and psychological hang-ups and shadow elements and all of this sorts of stuff. And that's what separates a great teacher from a mediocre teacher, is that the great teacher has worked all that stuff out. And usually by that time, he's 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. He's like a shriveled little man. Uh, uh, not some strapping young lad because it's taken him that long to really fully ripen and mature and to, to train this ox. The Zen master goes on to say, quote, you may search the world looking for truth, but there is no truth in the world. It arises from the heart mind. When the heart mind that is looking is true, then the world also is true. When the heart mind that is looking is false, then the world being looked at is also false. What is it for you to always be true? It is a matter of ridding yourself of thoughts. The true state of being of the human person is no thought consciousness. It is no mind consciousness. The true nature of our heart mind is like a mirror spot is like a is a mirror-like spotless condition, unmarred by even a single thought. The many unreal thoughts and ideas we have are images cast upon this mirror. No matter how much you search there for truth, there is no truth there. Our original nature is that condition like a spotless mirror where fundamentally there is uh, nothing. So the, the key idea here is this notion of no mind. That is ultimately what you're moving towards. Not just an awakening. That's hard enough, but still rather easy. What's really hard is no mind. Training your mind to completely shut off and not have any thoughts. That's what you need if you want to become a master. So take a look right now at how many thoughts your mind is thinking every single moment of the day and imagine a condition where at some point in the future you will not have a single thought for hours. You will be able to sit effortlessly with no thoughts. That's what you're ultimately trading towards. That's what it means to finally tame the ox. At that point, you let the awakening fully penetrate your mind and rewire your entire psyche and how everything works. And it's only then that you're able to see 
God and oneness and non-duality everywhere all the time. This is you working towards an abiding non-dual awareness, unsullied by thoughts. He goes on to say, quote, Moment to moment, no mind. Just advance down this path and you will be all right. To maintain this consciousness, to proceed in moment to moment mindfulness is what is meant by taming the ox. This post-satori training, this is post-satori training. Only a person who has trained and attained satori does this kind of post-satori training. Those who have not seen their own true nature, who have not attained satori or awakening, can do nothing but stir up more unreal thoughts. When the ox has been tamed, though you do not use the whip or the line, it will always follow you like a well-trained dog. Though you forget all about koans, you will always be in no mind. You will get so that you will always just be blank, thinking of nothing. You must train the ox so that you will not lose Kensho, so that you will not lose Buddha nature. It is truly a great pleasure when you know that you can always savor the world of no mind in this way. There is no pleasure as great as this. It is not just a matter of one or two days spent training or taming the ox. It is not a matter of merely a five-day sashin. A sashin is a Zen enlightenment intensive. You must live in continuous concentration upon mindfulness. So this is where the bulk of spiritual practice lies, is in this constant, never-ending mindfulness. Just grounding yourself over and over and over again into the present moment. And as hard as that was during Yamada Mumon's time, it's even harder today in the 21st century, in the year 2018. Because now we're inundated with social media, cell phones, computers, advertisements, Facebook, magazines, strange political news, which is sensational and shocking, and um, food, which is designed to titillate all of your taste buds and to addict you, and various kinds of drugs and pills and substances which addict you, various kinds of businesses which addict you. So all of this is... Uh, removing your natural ability to be mindful and present in the moment. So you're going to have to work extra hard these days in order to achieve this state of no mind. Let's move on to the next picture, number six. Riding the ox home. The verse. Riding high on your ox, leisurely you head for home. Trilling on a nomad's flute, you leave in the evening mist. In each beat and verse, your boundless feeling. To a close companion, what need to move your lips? So this now is the stage where you have finally started to attain some serious embodiment of your awakening, and you are now well on your way to becoming a master. And at this point, there's not uh, much of a need even to talk about it anymore. It's not some fantastical thing that you've attained. It's starting to just become your ordinary way of life. Here's what the Zen master has to say about this. Quote, Having liberated yourself from the round of birth and decay, you must once again return to the world of impermanence, which is the ordinary world. When one attains Kensho, then on returning to the original world of impermanence, that world of impermanence becomes the world of reality. So here, this is my commentary, so here what's happening is that you're bringing the non-duality back into the world of duality. You're bringing the absolute back into the world of relativity. You're bringing the mystical back into the mundane and you're fusing these things, two things together to form a true non-duality. And he goes on to say, to be right in the very middle of the ceaselessly churning, just this is the pure land of serenity and nirvana. One who refuses to, to return is not genuine. In the everyday world of common sense, flowers are red and willows are green. But in Zazen, one destroys that world of common sense and enters a world where flowers are not red and willows are not green. 
But then one must not stop at this point. Only when you have returned to the world of where flowers are red and willows are green has one really attained truth. End quote. So here is again where uh, the true master is born, is when all of these lofty mystical states and samadhi experiences, when those are all fused back into your everyday life, and you can just walk and talk and cook your food and do your dishes and, and take a shower and do your business uh, in the world and engage in, in, in economic activities, uh, engage in relationships, and all of this still is infused with the non-duality because you've really tamed this ox. Next, he says, quote, As training the ox proceeds, unreal thoughts fade away. The struggle between delusive passions and desire for enlightenment subsides. Both delusive passions and enlightenment fade away. Samsara and nirvana fade away. Person and ox fade away. Koans and zazen fade away. This is truly to be immersed in Kensho. Here you have reached the pinnacle of life. One who says, I want this, or I want that, or I want to do this, or I want to do that, is still wandering around in life's path. But when you have reached the peak, there is no need to climb anymore. No need to toil and sweat anymore. You just gaze up at the sky or look down at the world below. End quote. So, it's at this stage that many enlightened people will give the advice to newbies wrongly that, oh, well, there's no longer anything to do, there's no hire to climb, there's no work to do, and so then they, they give that advice to a newbie, and then the newbie misinterprets that advice and thinks, oh, well, then there's no work for me to do. But that's only from the vantage point of someone who's already done an enormous amount of work. Decades of work have gotten gone in to bring a person to the point where they can say, oh, I no longer need to do any work. I no longer need to sit on a cushion and meditate. I no longer need to do my yoga. I no longer need to self-inquire. I no longer need to be mindful and to practice and to, to read books. I no longer need that. Yes, after you've exhausted all of that, then you're good. Sort of like once you've launched the rocket into outer space and it's outside of the Earth's gravitational pull, right, yeah, you don't need rocket fuel anymore after that point. But when you're sitting on the Earth and you're trying to get up into space, you need a shitload of rocket fuel. So make sure you understand that distinction. He goes on to say, quote, those who still think about making money, about making a name in society, are wandering around at the halfway point. You worry about neither seeking Satori nor about extinguishing delusive passions. Cutting off all thought, there is no one in the world you think either nice or nasty. With the mind of no mind, you meet everyone as if for the first time. With that relaxed and expansive attitude, you casually leave everything to the ox, so that wherever it goes, you feel at home. End quote. The next picture is number seven. Ox transcended. The verse. Astride your ox, you've reached the hills of home. With ox put away, you too are at ease. The sun's risen three poles high, yet still you're dreaming. Your whip and line hang idle under the thatched eaves. This is the stage where you have now transcended the seeking of awakening and enlightenment. And this is the stage where some people could say, well, there's no such thing as enlightenment. There's no such thing as the ox. Yes, because you realize that you were the ox the entire time. Everything is the ox. This very moment right now, right here that you're experiencing is the ox. So, of course, there's no hidden thing that you're going to find. All you're going to find is the very present moment that's happening right now. But what will happen is that it'll get radically recontextualized and it will completely transform your life. 
So don't make the mistake of thinking that, well, well, Leo, if there's nothing to find, then it's just this present moment. Man, that's kind of depressing. What's the point of all this work if all I'm going to end up with is just this present moment? No, you don't understand. If you think that way, that means you still haven't found the ox. You don't realize what the present moment is. You don't realize the significance, the magnificence of this present moment. It hasn't actually been recontextualized for you. The recontextualization is a very real thing, and it needs to happen. That is the finding of the ox. That happened several pictures back. But for many of you listening, you haven't had that recontextualization yet. So don't fall into the trap of thinking like, oh, well, but the ox will get transcended and all there will be is just this present moment. All there will be will just be the self. But Leo, that, I already got that. No, you don't. You don't got that. What you have right now is a bunch of delusion. You have no idea how magnificent the ox is yet. The Zen master has to say, quote, having completed the practice, you get trapped by Satori. You start saying things like, I have had Kensho. I'm not your average monk. I must have a bigger cushion and my tea must be served in special utensils. I have completed Zen practice, so that means I can now drink. I can do anything I want. In this way, Satori makes people into its servants and strips them of their freedom. This is what is meant by the phrase, fettered by the Buddha, fettered by the Dharma. This is why, when you have attained Satori, you must forget about Satori. When you become a rich man, you must forget about money. If there is any distinction between the self that has awakened to the Dharma and the Dharma to which the self has awakened, the awakening is not genuine. The self and ox are one. The ox pictured here is being used only as a symbol, as a convenient teaching device. And the search for the ox represents the practice and discipline required in seeking the Dharma. End quote. Don't get confused by this word Dharma. All this means is it just means it's, it's the work of spiritual practice. It's the path towards enlightenment and liberation. That's basically what the Dharma is. So the path and the ox and yourself are really all one and the same. That's non-duality. So all these boundaries that you thought existed, all these different categories and different objects, all of them get realized as absolute unitive non-dual consciousness. He goes on to say, quote, in order to catch a rabbit, you must set a snare but the object is to catch a rabbit, not to catch a snare. When you have caught the rabbit, you no longer need the snare. The ox is used in the same way, as a means of achieving awakening to Buddha nature. We created a snare called the ox, but once you have understood Buddha nature, you no longer need the ox. End quote. See? And again, sometimes people make the mistake of thinking, well, if I don't need the snare, then that means a newbie doesn't need the snare either. But no, the newbie needs a snare because he hasn't caught the rabbit yet. A hungry person needs the snare. Once your belly is full of rabbit, you don't need the snare anymore. So it's very easy for a person who's just stuffed himself full of rabbit to tell the hungry person, ah, oh, don't worry about rabbit, you don't need rabbit. That's only from the point of view from a person whose belly is full. From the hungry person's point of view, from your point of view, who's still trying to find the ox, it doesn't help. That advice doesn't help. You need to build a snare. You need to glimpse this thing called an ox. The Zen master goes on to say, quote, Once a student came to me and asked, what is the purpose of life? When I replied to play, he was disappointed. Just to play, is that it? He asked and went away. Once you have reached the last station at the end of the line, there is nothing to seek. All one does is play. Here, to have things is fine. Not to have things is also fine. To live is fine. To die is also fine. To be happy is fine. To be sad is also fine. If it rains, that's fine. If it shines, that too is also fine. Every day is good. Every day is good. End quote. 
that is liberation. That is unconditional happiness. Happiness which does not hinge on any kind of external circumstance. Again, newbies sometimes make the mistake of thinking, uh, but Leo, if I'm going to be happy under all circumstances, whether I'm rich or poor, or whether I have sex or not, or whether my kids are healthy or not, if I'm going to be happy under all of those circumstances, then what's the point? But you see what you're setting up there is you're, you're setting yourself up in a, in a sort of rigged game where you can never win. Because by definition, then, if you're, if you're rejecting unconditional happiness, that means that you, what you want is you want to be suffering half the time. And of course, that's exactly what you've got, is a life that's half suffering and half good. So what liberation means is precisely that you take yourself out of the equation of life, you realize no self, and then what you realize is that once you're dead, once the self is dead, and that is what we're talking about here, we're talking about suicide in a sense. Not in the physical sense that you think that you're going to harm your body, but we're talking about the suicide of the notion of a self or a you. That's what awakening is. That's what the discovery of the ox is. But why is that so magnificent? Because once you're out of the equation, then all there is to life, once you're dead in a sense, is there's pure positivity. Everything is bonus. Everything is just sort of a cherry on top. Nothing can ruin your day because you're dead. You're not attached to anything anymore. You have nothing to defend anymore. You're not trying to defend your life, your body, your self-image, your social status, your wealth, or uh, your notions of religion or family or politics or government or anything. You're not, you're not defending anything anymore because you've surrendered everything so completely that now it's sort of like your nihilism has gone full circle. And at the very uh, end of nihilism is an inflection point where the nihilism then explodes into just infinity Emptiness explodes into everythingness. And once you're dead, you realize that that's it. That's the worst. You faced the worst thing that could possibly happen to you. And you did it by your own hand. It's sort of like you took a sword and you slit your own throat. And at this point, that's it. There's no more problems. Every day that you get after that is just a good day. Everything is fine, no matter what it is. That is liberation. And it's only from that place that now... You can play. And here, Yamada Momon says that the purpose of life is to play. And I've said that in the past before, because I've had that exact same realization when I've had my Satori's, is that there is no purpose to life other than life itself, being itself. And then what do you do with the rest of your life after you realize that? What do you do with the rest of, of your life after you've died? You just bask in the beauty of it. It's just pure beauty. It's just pure magic. It's all extra. It's all bonus. It's all heaven. You're literally inside of heaven because you have nothing more to lose because you've already voluntarily surrendered any attachments that you've had uh, and ultimately your entire life. Uh, that's not meant metaphorically. That's meant literally. You've literally surrendered your entire life by this point if you've gotten this far. And now you can see why this is so difficult. Are you willing to lay your neck on the chopping block and surrender your whole life in order to attain heaven, nirvana, and everlasting peace? Are you willing to make the radical transformation in your psyche to be happy unconditionally all the time under all circumstances, no matter how bad or ugly you may have thought they were before? such that you're happy no matter what. If Nazis are taking over, you're happy. If terrorists are bombing the world, you're happy. If nuclear weapons are going off, you're happy. If there's millions of poor people starving and dying, you're still happy. Most people would say, no, Leo, I don't want to be happy under those conditions. 
I would rather suffer. I want to fight. I want to create a good world and I want to help people and I want equality. I want to save the polar bears and I can't be happy when there's global warming and I can't be happy when there's terrorism and I can't be happy when such and such a person is a president and I can't be happy in this country and I can't be happy under this condition and I can't be happy ever. Well, there you go. That's why you're not happy. This is a very deeply counterintuitive move to surrender yourself to be happy under all conditions. Very, very counterintuitive. You're gonna have to hit your head against that wall over and over and over again until you realize, realize the foolishness of the way you've been living your life. And your, insistent on, your insistence on conditional happiness. Every fool insists on conditional happiness. Every fool can be conditionally happy when he has money and sex and healthy children and all of this stuff. But that's not going to last. Even if you acquire all of that stuff, it ain't going to last. You're going to lose your good looks. You're going to lose your teeth. You're going to lose your health. You're going to lose your children. Uh, you're going to lose your dog and your cat and your wife and your husband will probably leave you at some point. You'll get divorced and it'll be nasty and... If you feel good and happy right now, tomorrow you'll lose that. If the economy is good right now, tomorrow it won't be. If violence and terrorism and genocide is under control right now, next year it won't be. The Zen master goes on to say, quote, To penetrate right through judgments of good and bad, isn't that your original face? Isn't that Buddha nature? When the clouds of good and bad have been swept completely away, then isn't that the moon of reality shining there? To think that the clouds represent bad and the moon represents good is a mistake. The clouds represent both good and bad. When the clouds of, of both good and bad have been swept away, then a brilliance appears as eternal and unchanging as the gold which has been refined from the ore. End quote. Again, another very, very counterintuitive move is made here by the master. He surrenders all discriminatory thinking, all judgment, and all ideas and notions of good and bad. Most ordinary people think that if you did this, then your life would go bad, and you would attract all sorts of bad things into your life but they don't realize that good and bad are two sides of the same coin. And at the same time as you're judging certain things good, automatically that's bringing bad into your life. By saying that's a good person, the only meaning that word has is because there's some other bad person that you're pointing to a minute later that you're using as a foil to contrast the good and the bad. And so of course you're going to love the good, but you're going to hate the bad. And so that hatred is going to permeate you. You're going to be afraid of those bad people or those bad circumstances. So the counterintuitive move is to, to get rid of the good and the bad. And when you do that, something very counterintuitive happens. Everything gets transformed into goodness with a capital G. This is no longer good relative to your ego or to your personal desires. This is good in the sense that the entire universe now is good. All of reality now is good to you. Everything. You don't discriminate any longer. Remember, you've silenced your mind, so now you're constantly in a state of no mind, so literally you no longer have thoughts of good and bad. Something happens in your life which before you would have called bad, which most people think of as bad. You think, well, it really is bad. My dog got run over by a bus, but that's really bad. That's how you used to think. Now, you don't even have a thought about it anymore. And now, that's peace. That's happiness. That's liberation. Now you can play. That's quite radical. Most people, if they were given an option to push a button and to transform their psyche into this mode of being, they would probably not push that button. Of course not, because the ego will say, no, 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 I want to judge. I want to judge. 
Because Leo, there really are good things and there really are bad things. This is not relative. This is not just a projection of the mind. This is, this is real. My dog was really good and my dog dying is really bad. So I'm not going to push that button because I don't want to be happy if my dog dies. I want to suffer and be miserable. Well, you got it. There you go. That's your life. That's your mode of being. That's how 99% of people are. By the way, don't misunderstand me. This is very difficult to achieve. We're talking about some of the most advanced stages of human development right now and consciousness. So if you're thinking to yourself, well, Leo, but this is all wishful thinking. This is not possible. I don't know any human beings, my, my friends, my family members, my boss, my coworkers. I don't know any people, not even my pre professors and teachers who have this kind of mode of, of being, who have this level of consciousness. That's right. That's why none of them are Zen masters. At this point, we're not just talking about a little awakening. We're not just talking about some hippie who smokes some weed or does one or two psychedelics and thinks he's seen God. We're not even talking about Zen monks who have spent 10 years practicing Zen and have had some satori's, but still are, are kind of shaky on it. We're now at the level of we're talking about Zen masters. We're talking about people who are like one in a million, extremely rare. So yeah, these are people who have completely surrendered their entire lives and transformed their entire psyches. That's what taming the ox was. So at this point for them, this is not wishful thinking. This is their reality. This can be your reality, but only by undergoing a radical transformation with lots of work. To get to this point would require thousands of hours of work, 5,000 hours, 10,000 hours, 20,000 hours, that's what we're talking about to get to this level. Just so you understand, don't create a limiting belief out of this, but just so that you have a realistic idea of what it really takes. In the same way that if you came to me and you said, Leo, I want to become a brain surgeon, what do I got to do? I would tell you, get ready for 10 years of grueling study and residency after residency after residency and cramming for test after test after test and working in hospital after hospital after hospital for thousands of hours, many, many thousands of hours, 10 years at least, then you've got a shot at becoming a brain surgeon. Right? That's not a limiting belief. That's just the reality of what it takes to become a brain surgeon. And to, to fool yourself into thinking that you can become a brain surgeon by reading one book and watching a few YouTube videos and maybe operating once on a dead cat that you found on the side of the road and now you think you're a brain surgeon, well, you can see how that leads to all sorts of disaster. And it does. In spiritual circles, it definitely leads to disaster. This is where you get teachers and, and so-called fake gurus and frauds who create all sorts of cults, who lead people down bad roads, who uh, who run various kinds of scams and pyramid schemes. And um, even though they might be trying to teach you spirituality, they themselves are still deluded and they will teach it to you in the wrong ways. And then maybe they will sexually abuse you, molest you, psychologically manipulate you, or try to start a religion of their own, use it to aggrandize their ego, all this sorts of stuff. That's what happens. The Zen master goes on to say, quote, once you have separated out Satori from delusive passion, then that Satori never gets mixed together again with delusive passion. End quote. But remember there, here's my commentary about that. <laughs> Don't expect that to happen without having done the work. That will only be true once you're now at this stage seven. That's the picture we're at here, seven now. Once you're at stage seven, after years and years of work, now finally you've separated out your egoic delusions and devilry from Satori. And now it will stay that way. But it won't stay that way after your first Satori. After your first Satori, those things will get mixed back together. And in fact, that devilry within you will try to co-opt the Satori and use it for its devilish purposes. Now let's move on to picture number eight. The ox and 
the self both transcended. The verse. Whip and line, you and the ox, all gone to emptiness. Into the blue sky for words too vast. Can a snowflake survive the fire of a flame pit? Attain this and truly be one with the masters of the past. So, um, this is a very advanced stage. This is where basically you transcend everything. You surrender everything. The Sufis might call this stage Fana al Fana, the passing away of the passing away. Everything passes away. The ox passes away. All of your techniques pass away. Meditation pass away. Yoga methods pass away. And even the self passes away. And all of your ideas about non duality pass away. All effort passes away. It's a complete emptiness, which is why this picture is just a blank circle. True emptiness. Of course, don't mistake this for some kind of bleak nihilism. It's the exact opposite of that. Because this emptiness goes full circle and it there's an inflection point where all that emptiness also spills out into infinity, all of the form, all of reality, the entire present moment, all of it is you. You realize that you are God. You also realize that everything that has ever happened has never really happened. It might seem like some stuff is happening in the world and there's important stuff going on and evolution is happening and all of this. But at this stage, at stage number eight, you realize that none of the universe has ever even transpired. None of it has happened. It's all pure emptiness or mu. Pure nothingness. This is a shocking and radical depth of non-duality. Way beyond a merely a little ordinary satori. Way beyond even the, the insight of no self. This is, this is a complete radical nothingness. Very radical nothingness. Which is shocking and horrifying at the same time but also wondrous and magnificent and divine, all at the same time, sublime. An utter mindfuck. You've been completely mindfucked by this point in the journey. Here's what the master has to say about this. Quote, There is no satori or awakening, no dharma to be awakened to, and no self-awakened. Here, Buddha nature stands completely and totally revealed. This is the culmination of practice and the completion of the discipline. It is, in other words, the perfect circle. Perfect roundness suggests vast emptiness. It lacks nothing and has nothing in excess. It is neither male nor female, neither young nor old, neither rich nor poor, neither learned nor unlearned, neither good nor bad. It is the complete just-so world of Satori." End quote. So here he's describing the ultimate depths and degrees of non-duality. The realization that all distinctions collapse, all boundaries, all objects, everything. You can't even distinguish existence from non-existence anymore. You can't distinguish life from death. Because none of it is real. At this point, you realize the origin and source of the entire universe, where it came from, and where it's going. Namely, that it never really happened. At this point, you understand the answer to the question, why is there something rather than nothing? You've answered this question. The Master says, quote, those worldly feelings of needing a drink, by which he means alcohol, or desiring a pretty girl, have long disappeared at this stage. If you go around thinking, I have had Satori, I am enlightened. This is not really Satori or enlightenment. If you think, I am pure mind, then you have just muddied it. It should not be recognizable by Tom, Dick, or Harry. It's still not good enough if your consciousness is the kind that inspires awe, gratitude in people, that makes people talk about you. If this is it, it is a disgraceful scene. He's a living God. A miracle has occurred. 
If this is what is being said about you, that's bad. And an even uglier spectacle are those people who deceive others into saying such things. Both the whip and the line which you have used to train the ox have become unnecessary. Koans have become unnecessary. The person who was awakened and the dharma to which the person has awakened have all turned into emptiness. All have swept away, leaving not a speck of dust. No matter what you are doing, go straight into the samadhi of Mu and die cleanly. It is because you are still trying to hold back some breath that you fail. You must throw your life away. Then there is no self that remains. Not even so much as the tip of a hair's worth of self remains. Not even the Mu that you have been working on remains. There is nothing. There is neither training hall nor zazen. Just an empty mirror, honed and polished. Not even that remains. End quote. So he's talking about fauna al fauna, the passing away of the passing away. Um, the complete extinguishing of the self. At this point, you were never born. The idea that you are a biological creature who was ever born to a mother or father, this idea has gone away and you do not think of yourself that way anymore. There is no more self. You've never even been born. <laughs> Try to understand just how radical and freaky that is. I'm, I'm being very literal now. These are not just stories or metaphors. Try to actually imagine what it would be like to be alive, but to no longer believe that you were ever born. That's what this stage is like. And finally, the master concludes with this injunction. You must push yourselves to the utmost and attain this state at least once. End quote. And now we come to picture number nine, return to the source. We're still not done. Notice, we're still not done. And that's why this model is powerful. Because many people would be tempted to think that this is the end. I've already reached the end. And yet, there's still two more stages. The verse. You returned to the origin, went back to the source. Such wasted effort. How much better to just be blind and deaf. From inside your hut, you don't see outside your hut. Let the streams just flow on and the flowers just bloom red. Honestly, at this point, I don't have a good uh, personal understanding of, of what this stage really is. I'm going to quote the master here in a, in a second. Um, but personally, you know, I haven't attained all these 10 stages. Uh, I've had various glimpses of these different stages, and especially because I've used psychedelics, very powerful psychedelics, which of course are not really accounted for by this model, uh, it's a little bit hard to put my own progress into this simple linear sequence. And so if you're going to be using psychedelics, uh, don't expect all of your attainments to follow this simple 10-step process. Um, so I still have a lot of work to do. I still anticipate a decade or more work that I have to do to, to really fully embody and tame the ox. I don't even consider myself to have really tamed the ox, but also because I have access to these very powerful tools that I've discovered, I have been able to see some of the ultimate deepest levels of, of what mysticism and spirituality and non-duality entails, deeper than, than Zen monks who have been at it for 20 years. I've seen deeper. That doesn't mean that I embody it deeper all the time. It just means I've had those glimpses. And the power of that, there's sort of a, a, an upside and a downside of that. The power of it, the upside, is that it lets you really see what this path is about. And that makes you very motivated. And it also helps you to understand various traps that exist. And it also helps you to see just how much further there is to go 
how deep this thing goes and that so few people have actually gotten to the very end of it. It allows you to see all that, which otherwise would be unimaginable and, and virtually impossible. Only the most advanced practitioners, one, one in a million, one in 10 million, will ever get this far. Even of those people who become enlightened, only a small percentage will get this far. So that's why it's, it, that's a huge upside. The downside is, of course, that you see the full potential of, of what you can be and how deep this goes, but then, of course, your ability to embody it is, uh, is still very weak. And that just shows you how much more work to do there is for you. And of course, that can feel very overwhelming. It can be frustrating because you've seen these very deep glimpses, but then you still got all this grinding work to do of taming the ox. And of course, I know that the ox is right here right now. So there's nowhere for me to really go to tame the ox. I mean, this is the ox. I am the ox. Uh, there is no ox. There is no self. This is nothing. This is moo. But um, but it's it's one thing for me to just kind of say it or to be conscious of it now in the moment as I'm talking about it. It's another thing to be able to embody it throughout the entirety of your life under all circumstances. Um, that requires a lot more work on my part. So also, uh, at this point, it's good to, to tell you, don't take these steps too linearly and too seriously. This is a general guideline. It's a map. It's rough. Don't think that, oh, well, I haven't gotten to stage four yet, and that means blah, 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 blah. Or it's like, well, I'm at stage five, but it seems like I didn't go through stage four. Is that possible? Yeah, there, there's some variations. And of course, if you're using unorthodox techniques, maybe if you're doing some kundalini yoga or you're doing psychedelics or combination of all the above and and whatever, you know, you're spiritually gifted, your path might be different. So this is sort of an idealization of the path, a model, a map, not the territory. So here's what the Zen master has to say about picture number nine. That place where immaculate mind without thought is completely identical with the universe and all of its myriad things Nothing other than this can be considered absolute ground. Returning to this place is what is meant by return to the source. That's what this picture is. In Zen, what do we take as the fundamental nature of the universe? It is ox and self both transcended. Here, there is neither self nor ox, only the one perfect circle. Within the pure immaculate heart mind in which there is nothing, there is no distinction between self and the world. There is no intellectual obstructions or problems about the fundamental nature of the universe, its purpose, or anything else. All of your metaphysical questions have been answered. When you have gained Satori, then the world we live in, just as it is, is the pure land, is heaven. After Satori is the same as before Satori. End quote. And that is sort of the ultimate realization of non-duality. Now, I know that's the same thing I said in the previous picture as well. So you might be wondering, well, Leo, it seems like in every one of these pictures, you're saying that the ox and the self, it's all one. So what's the difference between all these different pictures and all of this, these different levels of oneness? Is it different degrees of the same thing? Or what are you talking about? Well, this is where it's a little tricky, is that yes, there are sort of like different depths of realizing the oneness of everything. At first, maybe you realize that you are one with the whole universe, and that's a big epic mindfuck and very revolutionary for you. But then you realize, wait a minute, that still wasn't complete because I was leaving at other people. I still, there was a still subtle duality between, yes, I knew that I was the, the whole universe, but I didn't fully realize that I'm also all people. And so that duality breaks down. And then maybe, you know, if you're, if you're a Christian or you're a Buddhist, there might still be a subtle duality, for example. You realize now that, yes, you're all people, but there's a subtle duality between you and Christ or you and the Buddha because somehow in the back of your mind, you were told that, well, the Buddha is this special enlightened being or Christ is the special savior, the one and the only prophet and all this. Um, but then you break that down and you realize, wait a minute, I am the Buddha. I literally am Christ. Everybody is Christ. To say that I'm the Buddha or that I'm Christ is not some arrogant position or to say that I'm some reincarnation of Christ. It's just to realize that everything is one. 
you always were Christ. Everybody is Christ. There's nothing special about you. The dog is Christ. The dog is Buddha. So there's sort of like a more fuller and fuller realization of the non-duality. And then it gets embodied at a cellular level deeper and deeper and deeper within you such that your behaviors and your relationships to the world, they become less and less dualistic the way that it normally is for people and more and more non-dual. That's basically what all of these pictures are talking about uh, in various degrees. And then the master says, quote, in order to go back to the source, you had to exert yourself to the utmost. On the outset, it looks as though you went to a lot of unnecessary trouble. All that work for nothing. This here now, just as it is, this very moment. If this is your goal, then you did not have to put yourself through such trials of searching for the ox. End quote. And of course, that's precisely correct. And that's why people say that there, there's, no, there's nowhere to go. There is no spiritual path. Because wherever you go, you're already going one step too far beyond the truth, beyond the present moment. That's what makes it so tricky and difficult because our mind is used to going through some linear sequence to get somewhere. That's easy for us. Even if it's a long sequence, we can do that. What our mind doesn't know how to do is how to be perfectly still and take the zeroth step. You need to complete the journey where there are no steps. How do you do that? That's actually harder. You might think, well, I'll just stand still and do nothing. No, that won't work. See? Because uh, by doing nothing, what's going to happen is you're just going to go along with the currents of society. Society will just carry you away. And if you just sit and do nothing, what's in, in practice, what's going to happen? You're not going to become enlightened. What's going to happen is that you're going to become a slob living in your mother's basement, eating Cheetos and playing video games and hanging out on alt-right forums bitching and moaning about how you can't have sex and how feminists are denying you uh, and how white genocide is coming. This is what's going to happen to you or some version of that, whatever your version of that is. That's what's going to happen to you if you do nothing, if you don't take the path. But if you take the path, you're also wrong because you've already gone one step too far. So what do you do? It's a paradox. You're stuck. I recommend you take the path. And then you'll realize uh, how to sort of track your way backwards to nothing. The greatest danger is doing nothing and getting swept away by the currents of society. That's what happens to 99% of people who don't take the path. And lastly, we've gotten to stage 10, the end. This is called re-entering the marketplace. The verse, with bare chest and feet, you come to the market. Under dirt and ash, your face breaks into laugh. With no display of magic powers, you make withered trees burst into flower. So this is the ultimate. This is, uh, you complete the path so fully that you forget that you even ever took the path. And you don't brag to anyone about it. You don't even talk about it to anybody. You are just a fully enlightened master. And you are so ordinary now that you just completely blend in. You're so humble that there's nothing special about you whatsoever. There's not even an ounce of selfishness or ego left within you. And so you don't go around flaunting your credentials or how many years you've spent on the cushion. or You don't even talk about non-duality to people. You just completely blend in. You're completely ordinary, such that when an ordinary person is talking to you on the street, at the bar, in the marketplace, uh, they wouldn't even know there's anything special about you. And uh, to me, that is one of the ultimate marks of a true master, is what I've seen from interacting. I've interacted with various kinds of enlightened masters and teachers and wannabes and students and so forth, seekers. Uh, and what I've seen is that those who I think have the deepest mastery, I've seen that they're the most humble. 
there's a very, very profound humility about them. It's awe-inspiring. It's amazing. And uh, you can't really see this as a newbie unless you've already gotten pretty high up the path. You can't really see this humility. You don't appreciate it yet. Because your ideas as a newbie of enlightenment are still like, well, I'm going to become enlightened and then I'm going to be special and I'm going to be cool and I'm going to sit there up on a pedestal and, and lecture to people and talk to people and people will love me and all of this and then I'll think I'm the hot shot and I'll be one in a million. I'll be that rare human being and I'll be the Buddha. Um, but all of this is still ego and arrogance. You don't realize yet that you're going to completely lose yourself. There's not going to be an ounce of self left within you. And that is what's necessary to be able to demonstrate that humility. That humility that I'm talking about, it's the ultimate honest signal. You can't fake it. And that's one of the ways how I evaluate and judge enlightened teachers and masters. I look at how, how their humility is, how they carry that. And that's how I separate the, uh, the fakers from the real ones. Here's what the, what the master has to say about this. Though you've attained this unexcelled realm of the absolute, you forget about the elevated realm completely, and instead, clad in ragged robe, return to the marketplace to settle among ordinary people. The ideal is not to put on purple robes and to wear uh, a gold brocade, brocade, Kessa, and march in a procession of dignitaries with that, that sanctimonious, I would not harm a flea, look on your face of someone who has attained Satori. Instead, you must throw away everything, become completely naked, melt completely in with ordinary people, and live alongside everyone else covered in dust. If you cannot quickly doff those robes and go live at the bottom of the social scale, you are not a person of religion. End quote. And uh, this is, I think, what was remarkable about Jesus and why he's such a powerful role model to this day, 2,000 years later, is that this is precisely what he did. Right? When you're driving around in your Rolls Royces and you have a, a big following of people who worship you and give you sex and food and luxuries and you have your own community and all of this sorts of stuff, you know, nothing against Osho. I think he was a legit enlightened master. Um, but there's still something about that that's just wrong. There's still a sort of like elitism about that. That's still not quite right. Yamada Mamon continues and says, He needs no shirt. He needs no title. Exposing his hairy chest down to his navel. Barefoot, he walks the streets of town or heads for the outskirts. Since people will be nervous if he shows that he has attained Satori, he does not reveal that he has mastered the discipline, nor does he show any trace of learning. He just laughs, laughs like a great fool, daubed with dirt and covered with ashes. That laugh, how could you describe it? He laughs so hard, you think his jaw would fall off. People who come into contact with that laugh return to their original good nature and awaken to their Buddhahood. Though he does not preach or lecture, everyone who sees the old monk's face is saved. Just by laughing and smiling, he leads those who are rough and coarse in heart to discover the light in their lives. He does not preach miracles. He just laughs. He just drinks with them. He just sings with them. When you have reached this highest awakened state, where the world just as it is, is the pure land, is heaven, where you yourself, just as you are, are the Buddha, then you must throw away Satori, and for the sake of those in suffering and distress, descend to the bottom of society, to the furthest corner of society, and awaken everyone else to this pure land as well. And that is the end of the path. 
So now you know what you're in for. Yes, it can be a little bit daunting. It's a lot more than you bargained for or that you initially thought. In a certain sense, we have to sucker you into non-duality and enlightenment because if you were told all the trials and tribulations up front of what this path entailed, you would probably be scared off and you would just kind of uh, go back to your old ways. You would never even begin. But by this point, you're probably already in past the point of no return. You already know too much. You can't really go back asleep after you've heard all of this, after you've seen all the potential of what you can become. Now, after you know how much suffering you create and how much of a devil you are, how much of an ego you have, now that you've been given all the answers to all the existential questions of what consciousness is, what God is, what enlightenment is, what existence is, why there's something rather than nothing, what absolute infinity is, what God is, after you've been told all this, what, are you going to say no? Are you going to say no, I'm just going to go back to eating Cheetos and, and jerking off to porn and playing video games? No. This is what you've been born to do. To awaken. To realize Mu. To get to the tenth picture. That is the purpose of life. So, make your vow. Go back to step number one and make your vow. Hone your desire and start following the footsteps and get excited about meeting the ox. Will you be wise enough to follow this advice? You were extremely lucky to stumble upon this recording, however you got here, through whatever confluence of accidents and events, somehow you ended up here. And this, you know, deep down in your heart, you know that this is exactly what you've been looking for. This is your path. You can feel that it's right for you. You might be scared. You might be confused. You might not know all the details and how all of it will work out. You might not know what this means for your family, for your love life, for your relationships, for uh, your finances, for your business. But none of that matters. Because the most important thing is knowing what the path is. knowing what the highest priority thing is. Once you've got that, trust that everything else will fall into place. Yes, it will be difficult. Yes, there will be fear. Yes, there will be obstacles. Yes, you won't know what to do. Yes, you'll be confused. Yes, there will be suffering. The counterintuitive thing about the spiritual path is that it promises, you the liber it promises to you the liberation from all suffering. And it will deliver upon that promise, but only after a long trial of ever-increasing suffering and suffering and suffering, and then one day that suffering will just drop to zero. And so you need to be able to keep yourself motivated and encouraged and to console yourself while you're climbing up the mountain and you're going through all the trials and tribulations and obstacles and all the threshold guardians, you got to keep consoling yourself that it's going to be worth it. And how do you know that? Not by trusting me, but by feeling into your heart. Your heart will tell you that this is the ultimate path for you to take. And how will you know that's true? Because you'll be scared shitless of what this will mean for your life. Because you are laying your neck on the chopping block. And if you want a little bit more insight about that, go check out my episode called The Ultimate Hero's Journey. Or I forget what I titled it. The True Hero's Journey. I think that's it. Yeah, search for Hero's Journey. And uh, you will find my explanation of, of, of that. And uh, that will that will help to comfort you in your trial uh, in your trials and tribulations. 
as will this episode here. There is an enormous amount of wisdom contained in this episode and in this book. If you can find this book, I definitely recommend buying it and reading it. Even if you have to pay $100 for it, it's totally worth it. But if you can't, uh, I have distilled the nuggets of it for you here. Uh, the only question is, will you be wise enough to follow this advice? Only about one in a million will be wise enough to follow this advice. And an even smaller number will be able to complete all 10 of these pictures in their own life and to fully actualize um, their awakening. So what I recommend is that if you're going to be on this path, you return to this episode here and you review the wisdom laid out by this Zen master. Maybe you reread that book if you have it once a year just to refresh yourself and to keep yourself on the straight and narrow path because you will be tempted to diverge in various ways. And that's exactly the value of having a master in your life is that he keeps you on the straight and narrow path. Well, luckily through modern technology, we have uh, the wisdom of this master here in this video, here in this recording, which you can play back to yourself anytime you want until you've made it all the way. And then you throw it away. You don't turn it into an ideology or a dogma. Remember, all of it you're going to burn away, throw away. And that's the end. I'm done here. Please click that like button for me and uh, come check out my website, actualize.org. There you will find my blog, uh, the forum, the life purpose course, and the book list. My book list, if you're still on the fence about buying it, uh, it's very affordable. But uh, really what you get for it is you get a bunch of gems like this book. Many, many more of these are on there, books that will transform your whole life. And uh, I'm still adding more to it. I've updated my book list at least five or six times since I released it. I try to update it about twice a year, so make sure you check back. There's probably more books there that um, you should check out. And the books that I'm reading these days are the most powerful books, the most wise books, because I've, I've read so many books at this point, hundreds of books, that... Uh, most books these days, if I try to read it, I can't even finish it because it's just not a very high level of wisdom. I already possess more wisdom than most of these books have, but I still read because you never know when you've missed something. I still got to keep myself humble and there's still great books that I find out there. Um, and so I'll still be adding more in the future. And it's the ones that I add in the future that you really want to look out for because those are the ones that are going to really be juicy. So check that out. The updates that I do every year are free for those who've purchased the book list. So it's a very, very good value. Other than that, stay tuned. In the future, we may cover other models of awakening. Maybe we'll cover the Sufi model or the Christian model or some Jewish model. You know, I'm still researching these various models. And as I find stuff that's valuable, I'll uh, put it out there for you. And then um, by cross-referencing all these models, then you get a really robust sense of what this path is like.